if you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to get your Bibles and go with me to the book of James, as we're going to be spending some time in a series called Faith IRL, IRL in real life for those of you who are over 50 and you don't know what that means, like I am, okay? That's what that means. And so thanks for coming today. Uh, how many of you have uh, a sibling? You have a brother or sister, raise your hands, raise them up high. How many of you have an older brother? An older brother, raise them up high. How many of you, you are the older brother? You're the older brother, me too, okay? I have a little sister. Can you imagine if you have an older brother, if all of a sudden, you know, you grew up with your, your brother and all of a sudden your older brother declared that he was the son of God. How would that go over for you? What would that be like for you? Some of you would be Lord, more like maybe not the son of God, maybe more like Satan incarnate because he tormented you as you were coming up. But as we look into this book of James over the next few weeks, we need to, uh, we're going to be in it for a couple of months. And so I encourage you to read it for yourself. But we need to ask the question first, Who's James? Who is this guy who wrote, now we call them books of the Bible, but this specific book, many of them in the New Testament, is actually a letter. It is a letter that was written to be passed around to a group of people. And so who is this guy who wrote this letter? Well, most scholars believe that James was the younger brother, half-brother to Jesus himself that his mother, Mary, they shared that same mother, but Jesus being uh, miraculously conceived by the Holy Spirit, where Joseph would have been just like his stepfather, but to the others of his younger brothers and sisters, Jesus had younger brothers and even younger sisters, they they would have shared Joseph as their biological father, not Jesus, but the others did. And so there's something that's interesting as we begin to look into this book you know, and we, we discover what this means. John chapter 7 tells us this, that, that Jesus' family, maybe Mary did, and I believe she did, but Jesus' brothers specifically did not believe in him at this certain point when he began his public ministry. So it wasn't like Jesus, as he was growing up, Uh, with his brothers and sisters was like just doing miracles, just kind of punk his brother and sister or anything like this where they were seeing this. In fact, we don't even believe that Jesus did his first miracle until he turned the water into wine whenever his ministry years began. And so can you imagine what it must have been like to grow up in the family with Jesus as your older brother? Now, I was... uh, I tormented my sister some, okay? But Jesus never did this. Jesus was perfect and he was sinless. Even as a teenager, he didn't backtalk Mary and Joseph. He, you know, he didn't tell lies or whatever. It made me wonder if James at certain point, why he maybe didn't believe in Jesus. Maybe there was some jealousy that might have been there a little bit, you know, or we don't know this, but I wonder if Mary was ever inclined whenever James would get in trouble. Why can't you be more like your big brother, Jesus? You know, we don't, we don't know that that happened, but it just makes me makes me wonder what it must have been like to grow up in that family. And then Jesus, whenever he turns 30, he begins to, he begins his ministry years. He's, he's baptized and, and begins to do some of these miracles. And he begins to claim that he is the Messiah, that he is the son of God. Now, what in the world would have changed James's mentality To begin to actually believe that your brother is God himself. Scripture tells us, we're going to get in James in a minute, but in 1 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul writes this. Specifically, again, we talked about doubts last week and kind of moving through doubts. Paul writes this. I mean, what would have changed James's doubts to belief in Jesus? Paul writes, he was buried, that's Jesus, and he was raised from the dead on the third day, just as the Scripture said. He was seen by Peter and then by the 12. After that, he was seen by more than 500 of his followers at one time. Would have been a group about this size, maybe even a a, a little bigger, okay? Most of whom are still alive, though some have died. And then I want you to say the next part with me. And then he was seen by whom? James. This is not James and John, the brothers Zebedee. This is James, his little brother. 
He was seen by James and later by all the other apostles. That would have been James and John and the, all the other apostles, okay? At this point, James's doubt was turned to belief because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because he, is, he came back from the dead. He would have watched his brother die a horrific death, a brutal death on the cross. And he would have been heartbroken by that. Perhaps he didn't understand his brother yet, and he did not believe in his brother yet, but something would have had to have turned James to become a believer. And I'm telling you, it was the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If, if your older brother was, was killed brutally and murdered, and then he came back from the dead, you would wonder what in the world is going on here. And this is exactly, Jesus had said that he was going to come back from the dead over and over again. The resurrection changed this. Incidentally, that is one of many evidences of the resurrection of Christ, is that those who had run away afraid, those who were fearful for their lives for following Jesus, now all of a sudden they are emboldened. Now those who, who didn't believe, like James, now all of a sudden they believe. In fact, what we know about James, James became one of the very first martyrs. He was killed for his faith. And what we know is that people are not willing to die for a lie. They're not willing to die for a hoax. And so this is one of many things that leads us to understand that the resurrection of Jesus is what transformed people. Now, what I love about the book of James, and I want to urge you over these, we're going to go through this book over the next few months, probably will take us into the summer months even to a degree, because we're going to spend time here. You know, one of the things that if you're new here at EVC, I want you to know is that we're not trying to be a big church. We're not trying to grow a crowd. That's not what Jesus was seeking to do. Our heart is to do what? Develop disciples. We want to teach you what it means to grow in Jesus, not just grow a big crowd. You know, Jesus would, in fact, whenever crowds would gather around him, Jesus would often say some tough things, and he knew how to thin out a crowd pretty quick. Because one of the things that Jesus would say is that whenever you decide to actually follow me, which that's what I want to call you to, is following Jesus. That's what Jesus calls you to, not just not just a kind of a Sunday morning attendance thing, but Jesus wants you to follow him every day of the week, every moment of your life. You need to know this, and we don't want to water this down, that discipleship, Jesus would say, costs us something. That it will cost you to follow Jesus. Our salvation is free because he paid for it. It cost him his life. But when you decide to follow Jesus, it's not always going to be an easy thing. There's going to be times where you're going to face hardship. And I love this book of James because what you're going to find, and I like this, is that James is direct. He's very bold. He, he is going to speak. By the way, he became the leader, one of the key leaders in the church in Jerusalem. He went from not believing to now being a believer and also being a martyr and also being a leader in that church. He's a pastor to them. He is going to comfort people, and there's a fine balance that pastors that want to be good pastors have to walk. They want to be sure, and I want to be sure that there's times where I need to be sensitive to you where comfort is something that you need. But also in the middle of comfort, it's not just to make you comfortable. It's to lead you into a place in the middle of what you are facing to grow, and so what James is going to do is he's going to bring comfort, but he's also going to bring us a challenge. And the challenge is to grow. It's to grow in your discipleship as you follow Jesus. And so this is what we're going to see. If you like the book of Proverbs, which I do, I love it because it's so practical. In fact, when I was a teenager and decided to start following Jesus, whenever I was going to Boswell High School, I decided to follow Jesus while I was over there and the Lord was starting to change my life, God used the book of Proverbs and God used the book of James because it's so practical. And it's something I want you to know is that you're going to see practicality of those questions that came up in that video just a moment ago are questions that we all grapple with and we wrestle with. So let's jump right into this. I like this because James doesn't mince words. Don't you like it when somebody just shoots straight with you, right? And they don't dance around things James is going to do that. In fact, I'll just be real with you. Be warned. Sometimes James, it seems like, can kind of punch you in the gut a couple of times, okay? 
all right? And it's not like masochistic, but it's in this way of just speaking the truth in love. He will speak the truth to us, okay? So let's look at what he says in James chapter 1. Let's start in verse 1. This letter, it's a letter that he would write. Letters would be circulated amongst these house churches, okay, because they didn't have a building like what we have right now. Many of them had been kicked out of the temple. So they met in smaller groups. They met in circles as churches. This letter is from James, the guy I just told you about. And this is critical. And he says, a slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. You need to know right out of the gate that what James says right here could get him in trouble. Number one, With the Romans, because anybody that said that anyone other than Caesar is Lord, you could be instantly put to death. They could crucify you for something like that. Also, it would get you in trouble with the the Jews because they believed that Jesus was blasphemous and that that was blasphemy. So it could get you in trouble. It could get you killed with them as well. But James goes from not believing in Jesus to now he's putting his life on the line because he believes But he says something that I think is so powerful too. He says, a slave of God. That word slave is the Greek word doulos. And what that word means is servant of God and of Jesus Christ. Do you see that? Okay. He's talking about his big brother. He went from not believing to now he's saying, I am a slave and servant of Jesus Christ. Now, As a pastor to a group of people, this would have been a perfect opportunity for James to do a little name dropping right here. Do you know who my big brother is? But he doesn't do this. James shows us that what people need is they need pastors who serve and who aren't celebrities. This is exactly what he says right here. I'm not a celebrity here because of who my brother is. I'm a servant, I'm a slave of Jesus Christ, the God who showed us, showed me what it looks like to serve. And so he says this next, okay? And by the way, that is a lesson for all of us who are pastors today. If you're a pastor, if you're an elder, if you're a leader in any capacity, that is a model for us in what pastors and elders and leaders should look like. We don't name drop People don't need celebrities. That's the last that they need servants of God. Amen, right? People who serve, people who wash feet like Jesus did. This is what we see and this is what people are craving today. He says, now I am writing and he tells us who the audience is. To the 12 tribes. By the way, I always want to teach you this, that it's important that you don't just pull little bits of scripture out here and there and kind of form it for your purposes. It's always important to understand context. Right To get the context so that you can understand who he was writing to, when he was writing, why he was writing. And then we pull that out and we apply it in our lives because it is still applicable for us today. And so he says, I'm writing to the 12 tribes. And and notice in quotes here, the Jewish believers who are scattered abroad. And he says, greetings to you. I'm writing to you. He brings greetings. So who is this? These are people who were Jews who... they believed that Jesus was the son of God. They took Jesus at his word. They They believed that he had died for them and that he had been raised from the dead. And so many of them in the early church were coming to faith in Christ when Peter would preach and others would preach. Thousands would be baptized at one time because people started believing that Jesus was the son of God. In Jerusalem, there was a movement of God that was happening but you need to understand that, that people weren't excited for those that were coming to faith in Christ like we get excited here. And when you decided to follow Jesus there, again, it was going to cost you something. You got kicked out of the synagogue. To be kicked out of the synagogue as a, belie- as a, a Jew in that time, you lost your community. Many times you lost your job. People wouldn't do business with you, okay? So now because, I want you to envision, because you are following Jesus, now it's costing you something to follow Jesus. Sometimes it even costs them their lives. And we know that in the book of Acts in chapter 7, the story of the early church, we see that happening whenever a man, one of the first, the first martyr named Stephen stood and he preached to those religious leaders who put Jesus to death and he told the story of redemption 
to them, and then they dragged him outside of the, the gates there, and they stoned him to death. It cost him his life. So if you keep reading in the book of Acts, you're going to find that Jesus had said to his disciples, I want you to go into Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and where else? To the ends of the earth, taking the good news, my story, I want you to take it all over. But the church was growing only in Jerusalem. They were only staying right there. They weren't fulfilling the Great Commission. And so, so a persecution happened. And what you'll find in chapter 8, it started with Stephen being stoned to death there, is that the church was then scattered because they were running for, them, for their lives. They were trying to stay alive. They lost their homes. They lost jobs. They lost all of this, okay? And so now here's what he's saying. As you go through this, as you follow Jesus, and it begins to cost you something for your discipleship, then it, what James is going to do is he's going to recognize that this is not easy as you go through this. And now he's going to pastor them, and he's going to pastor us. And this is what I know, okay? This is what I've been praying, and this is why we're in this series, is this year we're really trying to be sure that as pastors we are leading you to follow Jesus deeper in your discipleship. And I want you to understand something. The book of James will help you know more what that means. And so we want to go through this together. And James is going to bring comfort to them, but he's also going to do what a good pastor will do. He's going to challenge them in the middle of what they are encountering. He's not going to water truths down for them. He's going to speak to them what they need to hear, not just what they want to hear. That's what a good pastor will do. And this is what he begins to do. He says to them next, all right, and he's going to give them some commands. And they are commands that are, are for us today as well. In verse 2, he says, dear brothers and sisters. So he is talking to believers. When, that is an important word you should circle in your Bible or underline or highlight in your Bible app. When troubles, notice it's not if troubles. Okay? That's important. When there's an assumption that we will go through troubles, and then he's going to say, of any kind, when they come your way, when it happens to you. Remember, many of them have lost their homes. They're fleeing for their lives. They're scattered abroad because they're being persecuted for their faith then he's going to say something that honestly is a little bit of a gut punch and it's a little bit hard to receive. In fact, what I would even tell you is that in the natural man, the natural flesh, and I'll tell you what my natural responses are when I go through hardship, it's going to seem impossible. But what I want you to know is that James is leading them to something that all of us need in our lives when we go through something. He's going to begin to tell them what that looks like. When you go through troubles of any kind, when they come your way, consider it, that also translates count it, an opportunity for great joy. For you know that when, you know, okay, so there's something of a knowledge that you gain, that when your faith is, help me out, what's the next word? Tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. He says, consider it an opportunity for joy. This word troubles is the word parasmos in the original language. It means, it can mean trials. It can even mean temptations. Now, I want to be clear. It's not God tempting you in this situation. It's when you go through a hardship, you face a temptation. What is your temptation? Your temptation when you go through a tough time, in some cases, is even to walk away. And many believers walk away because they go through hardships and they've not, they've not been equipped to suffer well through the hardships, okay? And so he says this, and I love that he doesn't just say, for those of you who are just being persecuted for your faith. Now, that was one of the things that this group of people were dealing with. But I'm glad that he says, when you go through trials, many kinds of trials, it could be all kinds of things that you're facing today. And I know some of the things that some of you are facing, but I don't know a lot of you, and uh, you don't know me yet. But what I know is this, is that in a group this size, that there's no telling what the person who's sitting next to you might be going through in their life right now. There may be someone who's seated next to you that they are in the most difficult time in their life. 
And you may have no idea about that, and nor do I. And so this is for you. Each of you, you will go through this, right? And he's going to say this. It could be a relational, this is various trials. It could be relational pain that you have right now. That you don't know why or how, but the bottom has fallen out in one of your relationships right now. That can cause us some deep pain. Maybe somebody betrayed you recently. Maybe somebody has, is, they keep ghosting you and they won't, you know, respond to you. And you, you're just, it's driving you crazy because you want the relationship to be right. Maybe it's a marriage situation and you don't understand why your marriage is on the rocks right now. And it's, it's failing and you are, you're struggling with this right now. Maybe it's a job situation that you're dealing with. Just your career isn't turning out the way you hoped. It could just be life in general. You're disappointed that your life hasn't ended up the way you envisioned it maybe a few years back. And now here you are in a place of disappointment. It's a trial. It might be a health diagnosis that was unfavorable. And doctors are saying one thing and, and you're hearing a few and you're just confused right now. And you're just like, man, I don't know what to do with this. That word parasmos, do you see this word trials? It can be a temptation. The temptation isn't what God produced for you, but it could be a temptation for you to walk away rather than to move forward in faith. But notice James says this, it's testing, testing your faith. How many of you, you were the kind of student or are that you like tests? Would you raise your hands, raise them up high? Usually in every service, there's usually one and there's always weirdos, okay? I'm just letting you know. You were the ones that ruined it for the rest of us on the bell curve or whatever. You're good at tests. How many of you, you don't like tests. You don't like them and you, they make you nervous. How many of you, you're terrible test takers? Yes, right here, okay. I kind of like lock up, okay. I can't, I, even if I study, right. Most of us don't like tests. I heard about a college kid who was in an ornithology class. I had to look up what that is. That is the study of birds, all right? Has anybody ever had that class? Okay, study of birds, okay? Uh, yeah, uh, nature center, I know, okay? And, uh, and so that's where she works. But the study of birds. And this, this kid studied so hard, but he was dreading the final exam because he heard how hard it was gonna be. But man, he studied. He studied all the bird sounds, he studied the colors. He studied all, even these obscure bird facts. And he gets to the test to take the final exam, and he walks in, and he's expecting that he's going to do a little better than what he, you know, because he studied hard. He walks in, he gets ready to take the test, and, and he's just stunned by what the test is actually going to be. It's not any of the things that he had studied, Right? And he's aggravated by this. Instead of it being like an essay to write about something or multiple choice, that was my jam, right? You can guess. Okay, true, false, 50-50. I'm good, okay? He doesn't get any of that. Instead, what he gets is one PowerPoint with 25 different sets of bird legs and bird feet. <laughs> and the test was identify each of these. And he's looking at this, and he's ticked off. And he finally, he decides to confront the professor. He raises his hand. He's like, excuse me, sir. Um, we didn't prepare for this. And, and the professor's like, well, you, you better just take your best shot because half of your grade is this final exam right here. And he just gets even more upset. He's like, this isn't fair. And, and you know what he says? I'm not doing it. I'm not taking this test. And he says, well, if you don't take the test, you automatically fail. And he said, fine. And he gets up and he starts walking out. And he says, if you walk out that door, you failed this class, young man. You know that, right? And, and, and he said, that's fine. And he looks back at the professor and the professor says, you fail. Young, young man, what is your name? What's your name? And he pulls up his pant legs and he said, you tell me what my name is. You look at these legs and you identify me, okay? Most of us... I know it's taken a few of you a minute. Get there with me. Get there with me. Most of us don't like tests. But here's what tests do. Tests reveal things. Tests reveal, honestly, what we really know, not just memorization but, or whatever. Now, the test that James is talking about here 
don't think of it as a pass-fail kind of test. That's not what this kind of test is. This kind of test would be more like a precious metal that is placed under heat. And under the heat, if you know about that, like gold, that whenever it gets hot, the impurities rise to the top. They make it more refined and pure. This is what he is saying is, is this. What, what the heat does in our lives is the heat reveals not only what we know, but let's just be honest. The heat reveals where we have weaknesses. The heat reveals, honestly, what we really believe. And many of us, we have a lot of knowledge about facts about God. And maybe you've grown up in church and you've heard things over and over again, right? And you have it up here, but the reality is you've not not applied what you've heard into your life. And so anytime a hardship comes... Right, And I'm not saying that it, whatever you're facing isn't hard, but any time a hardship comes, you don't know how to move through the hardship. I want to be really clear about something. I've been praying all this week because I know some of you are going through tough things. There were some that, that, that I know that got bad diagnoses this week. There's just certain things that are happening in families that I'm aware of. That's what happens in my job as a pastor is I typically hear all the rough things that people are dealing with. The last thing I want you to think is that James or myself is coming in with a lack of sensitivity. James is not saying, nor am I, get over your problems. That's not what he's saying. He's not saying pretend. He's not saying fake it till you make it. What James is acknowledging is that it is a real problem. It is real. And it's going to reveal some things within you where growth does need to happen. And what he's saying is, don't get over it. But what he is going to say is, I want you to begin to learn how to grow through this. I want you to learn how to do this. That's what a good pastor does. And that's what James is doing. I love what Pastor Tim Keller, who has since gone to be with Jesus. Pastor Keller went through a diagnosis and and a time with pancreatic cancer. By the way, he wrote a book called Suffering Cancer. And he wrote this book on suffering to help people know how to go through tough times. And then after the book was published, he gets a diagnosis of having pancreatic cancer. And Tim Keller, in an interview, he said, I looked over, I saw the newly published book sitting on my desk, and he said, I had to determine what, if what I wrote in that book is actually what I believe. That whenever I go through something that puts me through the actual test, that's when we find out what we really believe. And this is what he said. Affliction is how we move from an abstract knowledge of God to a personal encounter with God. How God begins to refine us. How we begin to understand that who God really is, even in the middle of our hardship... Again, some of us may have a lot of Sunday school facts about who God is, and we've heard the stories, but we have thought that those stories were just for them back then, and none of them apply for us today. And this is what James is trying to teach us, is is that these things apply for us, and that God wants wants you to grow through this, but he's also going to go with you through what you're facing. And there's something that i got to just tell you. As a pastor, I've been a pastor now for over 30 years. I've been at EBC for 25 years. And this is something that I've observed. And I've even, I would say in some times I've been guilty of this. I feel like that in the Western church, which we are a part of, that sometimes we as pastors have not done a good enough job preparing people for hardship. That we're not doing a good enough job. By the way, if you go and you look in the New Testament, what you're going to find is that most of the letters that were written were written to a group of people who were going through difficulty. Whether it's 1 Peter, whether, I mean, so many of them. They were were teaching things, but there were life things that people were going through, real things. And, And so I think that for some of us here in the West, we oftentimes, as we go through something, we either have false assumptions, and the false assumption could be that when something bad happens, 
well, I did something wrong, and so God must be punishing me or whatever, and, and right? And so there's this adversarial relationship with God that some of us, uh, we view God as just being angry all the time with us. Now, there are times where God brings discipline. Please don't misunderstand me. There are times where we go through hardship that we brought some things on ourselves, but I also want you to know that there are many, these people were following Jesus And because they followed Jesus, they were going through hardship. Do you hear me? Okay. And so I think sometimes there's also been some false teaching that is messing people up that that whether it's health and wealth, gospel, whatever it is, that that if something bad has happened in your life, well, it's because you aren't doing something right. And, and, and I just think that is, that is really messing people up because we need to understand that all of our forefathers in the faith went through difficulties. And this is in here to help us as we go through it. Jesus even said in John chapter 16, and we'll read it in a second, in this world, you will have trouble. You'll have trials. Jesus didn't sugarcoat it. James heard Jesus say it, and now he's repeating it. He's trying to teach them how to grow through difficulty in their lives. But I think we struggle with this in our culture, right? And we have a culture of a lot of technology that, that can make things easier for us. And we, we like comfort and we like convenience. And, and so oftentimes I think that we are actually shocked when regular things of life happen to us. It's like we almost have this... I say this pastorly, and I include myself, sense of entitlement that difficult things are not going to happen to us. Brothers and sisters, listen to me. There are most of the believers in the rest of the world, especially those who face hardship and persecution because they follow Jesus, they don't think like that. Do you know what they think like? They expect hardship now. So they're not shocked and they're not surprised. So I'd say one of the first things that James is saying, and by the way, Peter would echo this in 1 Peter. He would say, don't be surprised by the fiery trials that you face. Don't don't think that, that, here's the thought, that this is heaven. It's not Right? This world is broken right now. Now Jesus is redeeming it, right? And we'll have a new heaven and a new earth and all, and, and, and that's part of the redemption story. But James is going to, James is going to say in the middle of this, I want to give you some things that you got to do. I'm going to give you some practical things that James will say to us, okay? So when you face trials, by the way, we were singing, it is well with my soul. Man, you guys were singing that. And it was moving my heart. And I knew what I was about to come out and talk to you about. (laughs) And my prayer was this, is that, Lord, when we walk out of here, is that it is well with my soul would not just be words that pass over our lips, but it would be something that would transform our hearts. No matter what we go through. And if you don't know the story of how that song was written, I urge you to go to go look it up. I don't have time to tell you today of how Horatio Spofford wrote that. But you know, one of the things, how do you get to it is well with my soul? How do you get to thanking God for the wilderness, like we sang? I mean, those words are easy to sing. Are you living it though? Am I living it? Right? This is what James is getting at here. And so I, I, I want you to know that if you are in the middle of something difficult today, you're in a place where there is empathy for you. I also would tell you this. We're not saying get over it, but I want you to know you're not meant to go through what you're going through by yourself. You need people around you who won't try to fix your problems, but who will just love you and walk with you through it and go and, 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 and just continue to pray for you and, and just be quiet and not try to fix your problem, but just, you know what I mean? So you need that, okay? But James says... When facing trials, this is what he's going to say. You've got to start by choosing to change your perspective. 
You may not be able to change the problem, but the outlook that you have of your problem, the perspective can be different. He's going to say something that honestly, when I just read it in the flesh, it bugs me. It even kind of makes me mad sometimes when I've read this. When troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. I think the ESV or another says, count it all joy. It's really a little more direct there. Um, But I got to tell you, joy is not a natural response for me whenever I'm going through a hardship. Woo, I'm so joyful that this bad stuff's happening to me right now. It's not natural, is it? Do you know what my natural responses are? Probably the same as yours. I get angry. I get angry about, God, I'm mad about this. By the way, if you look in the scriptures, you'll see those are natural responses. You'll see God recorded it for us in the Psalms when David went through stuff. He would get upset, and he would talk about it, right? And he would be honest with God. That's what God wants from us. God doesn't want you to fake it either. He's not saying fake it through this. James isn't saying fake it. This is what he's saying here. God is going to have to begin to do something in our hearts in the middle of this. I also, maybe I won't get angry. Sometimes I get anxious. God, I don't know how this is going to work out. God, I guess I'm going to have to do this. I, don't, I guess you're not going to help with this. I'm going to take this on, right? And then there are times where I can even get in a place of despair. Maybe some of you are there, and you're like so close to walking away. Maybe you feel like God doesn't love you right now as you're going through what you're facing. God, how long? David would write that. How long, God? Why, God, the questions, right, as we go through these things, these are all things that all of us face. God, how long before I find the person that is supposed to be my mate? Lord, how long before we have the baby that we so much desire to have? Lord, will this pain ever go away, right? Those are the tough questions that James is getting to the heart of. Now, one of the things that sometimes I think is perhaps the hardest part of our faith God does answer and speak to us in prayer, okay? But I want you to know there are times that the scripture shows us where there is silence. I really believe that's the hardest part is to trust God in the silence. I really think that. If you're in the middle of a time right now, sometimes we'd be like, God, if I just hear a no, I'd at least be disappointed, right? If you told me no, but I would would hear you talking to me, right? Right? But sometimes I want you to know, Scripture shows us, it's not that God is aloof. It's not that God doesn't care. There is something that is happening in what is perceived silence. Pastor J.D. Greer, he, he calls it this, and I think it's such a great way of speaking of this. He calls it the blank spaces in Scripture, the white spaces. Like whenever um, David, okay, remember David, we did a whole, uh, his life story last year. David gets anointed as the king of Israel. He's a young man. Remember that? He gets anointed as as king, but David does not, after the, I mean, the oil is still running down his head and the anointing service there that, that Samuel has, Samuel leaves. David doesn't get to go to the palace and start trying on royal robes and putting on the crown. Do you know what David gets to go back to doing? Chasing around stinking sheep. And you know, so there, the story, the narrative of David's, there's a blank space there, and it picks up somewhere else in the story. Well, what's David doing during that time? Do you know how long that time was, by the way? Seven years. What's happening in the seven-year blank space? It feels like silence, I imagine, but God is doing something in David in the blank spaces. God is doing something in that time where he is refining him. This is where David would learn what it means to walk through the valley of the shadow of death and fear no evil. This is where the Psalms were formed in David's heart. This is where God was taking a man who could have easily gotten prideful as a young man being anointed as king. And God said, no, we've had a prideful king. We need a humble king. So God's going to take him through a time where he is refining him and breaking him, knocking rough edges off of him, getting him ready. By the way, he would finally get to the palace, and when he gets to the palace, he's got a crazy king that's trying to kill him. And then he spends more time where the blank spaces in the wilderness. Again, I just did that whole series in like five minutes. There you go, okay? (laughs) But I want you to know, this is sometimes where we are is in the blank space. And, And there's a couple of ways that you can go through the blank spaces. James is saying, 
in the middle of this, you can choose to get very bitter and stay bitter. But James is also saying you can also choose to change your perspective and you can recognize this, that God never wants to waste any of our pain. That even the pain that we're going through right now, God wants to take it and produce something within us that we cannot produce ourselves. I can't produce this naturally. Don't think James is saying, while you're in the middle of a hardship, you need to grind out yourself some joy. I'm going to be joyful. That's not how it works. What he's saying is, you can't produce this. There has to be a surrender that happens within you. And when you surrender and you don't strive, when you surrender, that is when God begins to produce this byproduct in you. And do you know what the byproduct is? Unexplainable joy. It's not a feeling. It's something that God begins to do within you. Unexplainable peace that doesn't even make sense when others look and they, how do you have peace right now? I, I don't know. I just know that God's in control of my life. And I'm going to rest in this truth. It's this thing that God is producing within us. James says in this trial, yes, I know it's hard. Yes, this isn't a good thing. Yes, this is something that's hard in your life. But I want you to lean into Jesus, not lean and walk away from Jesus. I want you to make a choice. Your part is the choice of cooperating and, and saying, I'm going to step over a line of faith. And God, I don't get this right now. I don't like this right now. But God, I'm trusting that you're going to do something in this in me right now. I would love it if you change my outside circumstances. And sometimes he will. Doesn't he? Yes. But what I'm asking for you to do more than anything is whether the circumstances change, that you change me inside that you're producing something in me that is different. James is saying this, which, by the way, here's part of the next command. This is what he's going to say the next part of this is, so let it grow. Let this perseverance grow. Let this character grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete and needing nothing. This is what it begins to look like. This is your participation. Let your troubles as you partner with God begin to cultivate your character. It's important that we know this, that just because you go through a trial, that does not automatically produce spiritual growth in you. People can go through, have you seen this before? People go through the same exact thing, the same scenario, and some get really bitter and there are some that grow and you're like, oh, what is going on with that person? And we see something different. Nietzsche, the philosopher, he's the one that coined this. What doesn't kill me only makes me stronger. You need to know, first of all, he wasn't a believer. He also died a very lonely, angry, bitter man. And here is the reality. Again. Just because you go through it doesn't guarantee that you're going to be better for it. Sometimes people just get really bitter and they die in their bitterness. Or you can make a choice in the middle of this. You don't have to have all the answers, but you make a choice to lean closer into Jesus. The great preacher Charles Spurgeon, the 19th century pastor, this is what he said. And this goes along with what we talked about last week. Times of doubt are like a foot poised to go forward or backwards in your faith. So you may be in a time of hardship right now, and it's like a foot that's poised. You can either go forward or you also can walk away. You have a choice. This trial can indeed, he says, take you further with God, but it can also drive you backwards into unbelief. And I've seen both of these before. There's this change of perspective. There's God doing something, which, again, there's another quick story for you. Uh, remind me of the story of a little bird. This little bird that, uh, for some reason, he needed to go south for the winter, but he missed when all the other birds went. He may have overslept. His little bird alarm didn't go off, okay? And so he missed it. 
And in the process of missing that, he's on his way south, but he hits a snowstorm because he went too late. He hits the snowstorm, and his little bird wings start to freeze up, and he goes in for a crash landing. He's down in the snow, and he's like, this is horrible. I'm going to freeze to death down here. His wings aren't working. He's freezing. It's a horrible situation. But the next thing you know, a cow walks right over him at this moment that he's down in the snow, and he's thinking, this is about to go from bad to worse. Do you ever feel like life is like that? And the cow does what you would expect the cow to do. I don't know how else to say it, but he drops a load of manure right on top of the little bird. And he's like, I knew it. It was going to get worse. But in the middle of the manure, his little wings starting to loosen up and he starts to get warm and he realizes he's about to be able to fly soon. And so he starts chirping, chirp, 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 chirp. he's excited. And then all of a sudden, a cat comes along and eats him and that's the end of the story. And you may be like, Pastor Bart, that's a horrible story. Well, there's some lessons that we can learn from the story. Number one, not everyone who drops manure on you is your enemy. Secondly, not everyone who pulls you out of the manure is your friend. And third lesson, when you're in the manure, sometimes it's just best to keep your little chirper shut. (laughs) Because that's when we oftentimes get ourselves in trouble. But this is not natural for me. What I typically am inclined to do, I had to even repent this morning before the first message because I realized I was complaining to somebody about something that was hard, is... I have to just learn to sit still also sometimes and be silent and trust and wait and believe that even when I can't see God is moving, I have to trust and believe that he is. That he is doing things that I can't see, right? Which is what he's saying, James is saying, let your perseverance grow. Let it grow. As you sit still, and this is a word that came up over and over again in the songs, in surrender. It's surrender. It's letting go of your grip of what you're facing. Every single one of the fathers and mothers of our faith went through a period of doubt and through a period of hardship where they had to decide whether they were going to believe what God had to say was true or not. And you and I will be no different in this. Whether what he says Moses did, Abraham did, all of these guys, we talked about it last week. And I know this, some of you are at a crossroad today. And you're either going to make a choice to harden your soul in the middle of your hardship and harden your heart. Or you're not just going to get over it. You're going to say, God, I'm going to trust you right now. I'm going to open my hands. I'm going to surrender because I know this. That in the middle of this, I know, I can't even see it, but I know that you are doing something in me. You're doing something in me. And what what is the perfection? The perfection is making us more like Jesus. But you know what that comes through? It comes through difficulty. It comes through suffering. We've been talking about discipleship this year. And I said a few weeks back, I hope you get in a circle with other believers. That's where you're going to grow. I hope you'll have your chair time. I hope you come and have row time where we teach you. But do you know in another, another important part of our discipleship? It's through difficulty and suffering. It's when we, we hear all the things and now we have to choose to actually put it into practice. And that's what James is saying. Put it into practice. Do you, do you really believe this? Put it into practice in your life. The great reformer Martin Luther, he said three things make for a great Christian. Bible study, prayer, and you're not going to like this one, but it's true. Suffering, hardship, it refines us. It reveals what we really believe. And I know none of us want that. If we were like, hey, sign up for a life group, many of you will do that. If we said, hey, we have a, we have a class that's going to make you suffer, nobody's going to go sign up for that, right? We don't want to sign up for that. Some of those classes, they may make you feel like you're suffering. Just kidding. All right, moving forward. (laughs) Lastly, okay, as we move into this, Jesus, I want you to know, James is echoing what Jesus taught. Jesus said in John 16, the night he would go, be betrayed, he would go, be crucified the next day. 
he's telling his disciples, I've told you all of this so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth, you will have many trials and what? Sorrows. But then he says this, but take heart. I want you to begin to see these things with a different lens. Take heart. Why can you take heart? Because number one, I'm going to go to the cross for you and pay for your sin. Secondly, I'm going to come back from the dead so that you can be raised to life with me. You can be restored into Eden and walk in relationship with me for the rest of your life. Thirdly, I'm coming back. And this is what he's saying. I'm in control of all of this. And then he goes on and he'll say again in John 16, you will grieve, you'll grieve, but your grief will suddenly turn to wonderful joy. It will be like a woman suffering the pains of labor. When her child is born, her anguish gives way to joy because she has brought a new baby into the world. So Jesus says, so you have sorrow now, but I will see you again. I'll see you again. I'm gonna be raised from the dead. I'm coming back again and then you will rejoice and look, brothers and sisters, and no one or no thing can rob you of that joy. Nothing can take that away from you. Nobody can take that away from you, Jesus says. But what James is saying is, I want you to trust God in the process. And here's the very last thing he says in verse 5 for us today. If you need wisdom, James says, while you're in this season of waiting, if you need wisdom, and I need wisdom, ask God. Our generous God. Do you hear how he describes God? That's literally ask the giving God. That's our generous father. He's not stingy with us. He's not like, oh, I love making them suffer. That's not what he's, he says. And look, and he will give that wisdom to you. And he won't even rebuke you for asking. He's not wagging his finger at you. I can't believe you got yourself in that mess and all. That's not how our God is. My kids come to me and when they are hurting, okay, there are things that sometimes I need to teach them, but I know whenever I just need to just hug them, right? And not just, you know, scold them for something or whatever. I just, they just need, maybe somebody hurt my daughter, maybe a boy broke her heart, or later I want to go punch him in the face. But at that time, I want to love, I want to just love on her, okay, in the moment. You know what I'm saying? It's, this is how our, and I'm an imperfect father, punching boys in the face. No, I don't do that, but I want to. But I just want you to see, this is what James is saying. Here's your other command. Keep praying to God. Keep on praying. Keep talking to God. Keep telling him how you feel. Keep sharing things with him. Keep expressing things. Here's the deal. Keep asking. Keep asking. Right? But there is a condition. As you ask, but when you ask him, be sure that your faith is in God alone. Be sure that you're asking and your faith is in God alone. Do not waver for a person with divided loyalty. That can translate in some of your Bibles, doubt. Pastor Bart, you said it's okay for us to, normal for us to have doubt. You will. I thought you said we can come to Jesus with our doubts. You can. Here's what this word literally means, okay? It's the word dipsychos. And what it means is with double-mindedness. And I'll explain that, okay? Here's what he says. That divided loyalty is, an un, is as unsettled as a wave of the sea that's blown and tossed by the wind, whatever the circumstances are, right? Such people should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Wow. James, again, doesn't pull punches. Their loyalty is divided between God and the world, and they are unstable in everything that he does. Some of you are like, I don't understand why God won't step into this situation He's waiting for you to lose your double-mindedness. Here's what double-mindedness means, okay? That dipsychos. It's not that you won't have questions and struggle with doubts. We all will. Every believer did, okay? And every believer does. It's this. On Sunday, yeah, Pastor Bart, I'm with you on this. I'm going to surrender this. But then on Monday, I'm taking it back for myself. That's double-mindedness. On Sunday... I'm surrendering my marriage to you, God, the brokenness in my marriage. On Monday, I'm going to punish my husband or a wife with passive aggression. I'm taking it back. You're not doing it fast enough, God. You're not changing. Do you see what I'm saying? On Monday, I'm going to trust, or Sunday, I'm going to trust you with my finances, God. On Monday, uh, you're not taking care of me, God, so I'm going to, I'm going to cheat on my taxes. Do you see what I'm saying? That's double-mindedness. 
And what he's saying is, if you're going to ask God, don't come to God and ask him to do something if you're not willing to follow him in doing what he says. You might as well not bother. What he's saying is, that's what it means, is that have faith that God is in surrender. This kind of surrender is this. I can lay my head down at night. My circumstances may not change, but I lay my head down and I know this. God is in control. And I'm going to live daily with my hands open. So I want to ask you to pray with me, okay? Let's pray. And I'm going to ask you to do something. If we're talking about prayer, and we're talking about some of you who are struggling and hurting today, I know there are many of you. This is what I want to ask you to do. If, if that's you, and you're just struggling, and you need prayer today, you want one of us to pray for you, what I want to ask you to do is I want to ask you just to sit still before the Lord, remain seated Nobody's going to come and harass you or anything like that, okay? But you just sit before the Lord, and you just open your hands to God right now. And this is what I'd like to ask the rest of you to do, okay? Maybe you're not in a hardship right now. I want to ask you to stand with me right now. Those of you who are struggling, it's okay for you just to sit still. We're not going to embarrass you, but the rest of you stand with me now, okay? Go ahead and stand. You can stand now. The rest of you, you're just in a place of just needing to sit still before God. And as I told you, we're a church that wants to love you. We want to support you. We don't want to try to just fix your problems. We know that they're complex. But I do want to, I want to be sure that we're praying for you. He says to pray. So maybe somebody is seated next to you today. I want to ask you to do something. You don't need to say anything to them or whatever. But I think it's important that people know that they're not alone. Maybe the Lord would just lead you just to put your hand on their shoulder and just begin to pray over them. And just begin to pray that God would bring comfort right now. Some of you, the Lord may move you to somebody today and you don't need to say anything to them. That's not what they're looking for. They just need brothers and sisters who will pray over them today. They are hurting. They're struggling. They need God to comfort them right now. And for God to begin, as we all surrender, to produce, not strive for it, but to produce, God produces the joy. In some circumstances, God's going to change today because he can, right? And sometimes he does that. But he certainly also wants to change every heart in here that's in the middle of a hardship. And he wants to comfort you today. The Holy Spirit, one of his names is Comforter. And he wants to comfort you. You're not alone in this. You have brothers and sisters that also love you and are praying over you today. So, Father, we do praise you that you are a God who is close. You're near to the brokenhearted. I ask you, Holy Spirit, just to continue to do your work in here at this moment. In Jesus' name.